Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Oh, there's your favorite guy. Hell, hell, the gang's all here. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you all. Let me change my view here before we get started. Can you hear that? There we go. That's better. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our third conversation on race. Um, due to this being Black History Month, uh, we decided to delve into the topic of yeah. Black history, which is everybody's history. So we have our very special guest and panelists from the Windsor Black History Society, oh, Black History Society, the Windsor Historical Society, which is the Windsor Black History Society. <laughs> Renamed. Um, so we hope that you enjoy today's presentation. Um, I just wanna make a few announcements before we get started. Um, first, I'd like to recognize our partners in this work, of course, the Windsor Historical Society. Uh, First Church of Windsor, uh, Senior Pastor Nicole, Nicole Grant Youngman, uh, Grace Church, um, uh, uh, Father Chip Elliott, uh, Archer Memorial, um, and of course the town of Windsor. I'd like to recognize our commissioners. Uh, I am the chair. My name is Judge Kevin Washington, if you haven't met me or heard about me. Uh, my vice chair, my new vice chair is Ms. Castella Copeland. Uh, she is also our facilitator for the day. We have Ms. George Armstrong, Byron Bob, Patricia Mack, uh, Leonard Swade, Joshua Amara, and Rebecca Jacobson, and Linda Massa, who are also commissioners for the Windsor uh, Human Relations Commission. I'd like to thank each and every one of you all for being here. And now I would like to uh, greet our panel. Uh, first, uh, I will introduce Salima Paster. Uh, she is the historical specialist for the Windsor Historical Society. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Salima. Hi, so yes, my name is Salima de Peister and I'm the community history specialist at Windsor Historical Society. I actually recently graduated from UConn and um, upon graduating, I started this position and I'm doing a lot of research on Windsor's residents and interviewing Windsor residents as well. I've done some oral history interviews one-on-one -on -one with Windsor residents and throughout our centennial, we've done our you know Windsor stories tent and we've gotten a lot of stories from that. So it's been nice working with the Historical Society. Thank you, Salima. Next is our very special guest and our other town historian is Miss Marsha Hinckley. Hello, how are you? Um, this is my least favorite thing to do is talk about myself, but I will say that um, I've been so thrilled to be part of this uh, opportunity to share Windsor history. I did my master's thesis on Windsor's African American history 30 years ago. So some of most of what I have to share tonight is from that. But I want to let you know how much good stuff has been done on Connecticut Black history in the past 30 years. So there's a lot to learn, more questions to answer. So I hope this is a teaser that we can do more to, to research our history. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Marsha. Next is Rain Eiffel, a program director for the Windsor Historical Society. Rain? Hello, everyone. So yes, my name is Rain Eiffel, or Rain Michelle Eiffel, just to confuse you all. And I am the newly appointed program director here at the Windsor Historical Society. I'm coming from a museum in Baltimore, Maryland, and my studies go between Baltimore and New York. And what I do here at the Historical Society is pull from all of my amazing colleagues, whether it's Kristen's work or Salima's work or Doug's work or Michelle's work, their research, and take all of what they do and what they found and make it accessible to student audiences and other audiences of the public. Make it engaging and something that's a learning experience, but also memorable. So it's not just, you know, the old school kind of tour guides, but providing you and music and movement into experiences that kind of click with students and make them remember what they've learned about Black history here in Windsor. 
Thank you so much, Raina. We're so happy to have you and Zalima as a part of that staff. Next, Michelle. Tom is an archivist with the Windsor Historical Society. Michelle? Yes, hi, I'm Michelle Tom. I'm the librarian and archivist at the Windsor Historical Society. Um, I have been, mostly I do a whole lot of genealogy for people, but um, just in working here, I've just had an opportunity to do so much research into the history of the town. And this last year, especially, I've been really digging into uh, the town's black history, especially um, 17th and 18th century black history. So sort of um, building off of Marsha's thesis, but moving into the earlier period that she didn't cover as much. So that'll be, that'll be what I am gonna be. <laughs> hopefully off on today. Thank you so much, much, Michelle. Kristen Wands is the curator of the Windsor Historical Society. Hi, Kristen. Hello. Uh, so yeah, I'm the curator. Uh, we like to say that Michelle Tom does 2D artifacts and I do 3D artifacts. So that's what I'm in charge of. Um, I take care of all of the physical collections here and I'm also in charge of the historic houses and putting together exhibitions so Rain is pulling together uh, all the great research that our staff does and puts it into public programming. And I pull from all that research and put it into exhibitions here. So I guess my uh, most recent experience with black history, mm -hmm. I'm changing up the exhibition that we have going on in the Chafee House to focus, uh, do a better job of presenting the history of the enslaved people who were uh, living in that household. Awesome, thank you, Kristen, we appreciate you. Um, and the big kahuna, Mr. Douglas Shipman, executive director. How you doing, sir? Uh, that's the first time I've ever been called the big kahuna of anything. So <laughs> I'll take that with some humility. Thank you. It's, it's great, great to be part of the program again this year as we did last year. And uh, I'm the executive director of the Historical Society. I've been here just about two years. I had the good fortune to start just as the pandemic began. So um it's been an unusual time. Much of what we've been doing here has been virtual, uh, kind of like we are now, but we try to get outside and, and try to do things in person as much as possible. Um, one of the things we have done over the past couple of years is refocus, as you can hear, uh, our programming and our research uh, and also our strategy as an organization. So um, we have, uh, with the full endorsement of our board committed to being the first in our region to center our history and culture on the lives of racially and ethnically diverse members of our community. Uh, that is a big statement for a mostly white organization like this historical society to make. Uh, it's one that we feel like we put our money where our mouth is uh, and are fully committed to living that. So what you're hearing today and what you'll hear from a lot of the folks, you know, Marsha Hinckley, who did her fabulous thesis over 30 years ago, that the information about uh, Windsor's Black history has always been there, right? Uh, we're not digging up new things that did not exist before. We're finding things that nobody bothered to look for in the past. Nobody bothered to prioritize, and we are prioritizing that history. So uh, that's really critical for us. We, we hope that people in the community find that that is also important to them as well. So we look forward to a good conversation tonight. Thank you so much. And I just want to recognize Ms. Agnes Pierce here. Thank you, Ms. Agnes, for being here. Appreciate it. Mr. Randy McKinney and Ms. Jody Terranova. Mrs. Jody Terranova. Thank you all for being here. And Ms. Florence, I see you. <laughs> I also want to say that uh, with the work that the Windsor Historical Society has done, um, we, we at the Human Relations Commission do did recognize that change and that leadership um, development. And so they are one of the recipients of this year's uh, Bridge Builder Award, the staff. Uh, if you remember, Douglas won, I think last year, right, Douglas, or a year before? Yes, I, I felt like President Obama who got the Nobel Prize before he even did anything. So uh, exactly. <laughs> but it was much appreciated uh, by our board, uh, many of whom are here tonight and our staff. And, and it really represented their work uh, more exactly. than mine. Exactly, and we knew you were in trouble when you came. So, you know, we had to give you an award for something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we appreciate the efforts 
and we recognize you, Windsor Historical Society. Um, without further ado, I'll have some announcements at the end. I'm going to turn it over to our facilitator um, to um, go on to our programming for the afternoon, and we'll get started. Welcome again. Thank you for being here. Call your friends, tell them, send them an email, let them know we're here. We're on. Excellent. Thank you so much, Judge. So I'm just going to go over a quick um, few points to make sure everyone feels comfortable and safe in the space. Those are created. So um, our guidelines and expectations for our conversation tonight is to speak from the eye. So speaking from our own personal experiences. Um, or in this case for history, like speaking from, you know, the different um, research data artifacts that we are finding to shed light to the stories, listening to understand one another. So not just responding, um, but truly trying to listen with an open mind and an open heart, um, leaning into discomfort and feelings. Um, sometimes feelings come up when we learn new information. So just kind of welcoming and allowing that to happen. Um, confidentiality, or what I like to call the Vegas rule. So it's kind of all of the different um, stories, the personal stories that we share stay here, but the lessons that we learn leave go and go out into our community so we can continue to educate one another. Next, we have um, being respectful. So I, I know um, Doug and friends have lots of great I, things that they're gonna share with us. So we're just gonna um, listen to them and their presentation. And then we're gonna have uh, moments later on in the program where the audience will get to come in and out for um, questions. So if you have a question or anything, feel free to type it in the chat. You can raise your hand, or if you wanna follow up with something, um, just feel free to do one of those things and we'll be able to respond pretty quickly. Um, and finally, um, participate and converse with each other. We really um, encourage you to challenge yourself and, and participate because the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. So I just hope we'll have a great conversation and the first step, step starts with ourselves. So thank you so much for being here. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Doug for all of our amazing content to come. I'm super excited to see what you all have. <laughs> hey, well, um, thank you, Cassie. And I'll I guess we can put up the questions uh, in, in just a minute, maybe just a couple of introductory remarks and, and do want to thank uh, you and Judge Washington and the, the Human Relations Commission for uh, hosting this and, and all of these in the series because they're so, so important. Um, I, I do thank our panelists for spending time on a Sunday night uh, and, and we are literally uh, zooming in from around the country. Michelle may not have mentioned, but she's out in California on vacation, but felt this was so important uh, that she wanted to join us. So I really do appreciate that. And I do appreciate our board members being present tonight. We have a, a number of them here, a number of members, and, and they are very invested in, in what we're doing and are a big part of it as well. So um, as you know, black history is really global, right? Uh, as it relates to American history, uh, Black history is American history, as Judge Washington said earlier, but as we all know, it has not always been treated that way. Tonight, we want to talk about Windsor's Black history, as well as about how that history uh, has been and might be interpreted in the future. So while each member of the panel has a depth of knowledge concerning specific areas of Windsor's Black history, uh, we're not experts. Uh, and we approach this topic with deep humility. Windsor's Black history began, as far as we know, sometime before 1680, uh, when, uh, quote, unquote, Cyrus the Negro, as he was referred to, uh, was listed as property on Hel Henry Walcott Jr.'s estate inventory. Uh, you'll hear more about this in a few minutes. Um, there have been Black people, often enslaved early on and later free, in Windsor continuously since those earliest of days, and today 38% of the town's population identify as Black. Tonight we'll be sharing some specific information about this 350-year span of history, and also discussing how the stories of Windsor's Black residents have been told or, or not been told. Uh, we'll talk about who has the authority or agency to tell these stories, and how we can move forward to ensure that Windsor's residents of all ages and ethnicities learn this important, fascinating, and uplifting history. Um, tonight, we really have two kind of focus areas or questions. Cassie will put those up in a couple of minutes. The first is like, 
really looking at Windsor's earliest history up through, say, the early 20th century, uh, mid 20th century. And then the second uh, will we'll focus on more modern uh, history, contemporary history, and then resources, how you can learn more, how you can be a part of that, because we really think everybody has a voice in this story. Um, we have all of our panelists unmuted. So we're really hoping it'll be a little more of a conversation. So it won't be like, okay, panelist A, say your part, panelist B, say your part, and go on down the road. Uh, so people are invited to jump in as they have uh, something to add, something to contribute. Uh, or a point to make about someone else's uh, uh, remarks as well. And uh, Cassie will be facilitating. So we're excited to get this started. If you want to put up the first questions, Cassie, then uh, we can give everybody a, a chance to focus. Sure thing. So here are the first two questions here. Um, I will also put them in the chat. Um, these first two questions, I'll read it out loud. Um, the first one is, what do we know about Black people in early Windsor? Who were they and what do we know about their lives? What sources can people explore to learn about them? Um, so that's, I know, a loaded first question. Second question is how did Windsor's black population change over the centuries leading up to modern times? Where did they live and what kinds of businesses, organizations or activities did they, get, did they engage in? Great. Thank you. There's a lot here, right? We we are not planning to provide a lecture, uh, but as he said, more of a discussion and with some illustration as we go along. And um, there's more that we can cover in an hour and a half of, of uh, conversation on a Sunday evening, but hopefully enough to whet people's appetite to, to come and learn more. So I'm going to turn it over now to Kristen Wands, who's going to get us started with that earliest of Windsor's Black history. Yeah, this, uh, this, this question, I think, comes to me because it feeds right into a lot of the background research we did when we were looking at uh, the Chafee House reinterpretation. And like Doug mentioned, the first record we have of a Black person living in Windsor is this 1680 mention of a man named Cyrus. You can see the, a copy of that uh, 1680 record here. He was listed in Henry Wilkett Jr.'s estate inventory um, valued at 30 pounds at the time. Uh, like all of the earliest Black residents of Windsor that we know about, he was enslaved. And he appears to have been the only enslaved person in Wilkett's household at the time. Um, so like most other New England slaves, he probably lived inside the Wilkett family home and he worked closely with the family. He wasn't equal to them, but he spent his life alongside them. Uh, it's also a pretty typical record of the earliest Black residents of Windsor because this is everything we know about him. We don't know where he came from. We don't know when he came to Windsor. Uh, we don't know really what happened to him after this. So um, there are more questions than answers, I think, with a lot of this very early Black history in Windsor. We do know that slave ownership was extremely common among uh, Connecticut's elite white residents. By 1774, according to slavenorth.com, Connecticut had the largest number of enslaved people in New England, which was 6,464 enslaved people. Uh, census data shows us that half of all of Connecticut's ministers and lawyers owned slaves and a third of all the doctors in our state. At that point in around the, the last quarter of the 1700s, um, we start to see laws passed that uh, promote um, gradual abolition and um, prohibit the importation and purchase of new slaves. So we start to see the numbers of enslaved people decrease through the end of the 18th century and the number of free blacks increase at the end of the 18th century. But we also know that Windsor was home to free Blacks probably very early in our history. Uh, we know that there was a law passed in 1702 which required slave owners to care for enslaved people who are infirm or destitute rather than releasing them into the community to be free. Uh, this was intended more to protect the state and the towns from having to pay for the care of people who couldn't care for themselves than to protect the, the freed people. Uh, but it's, the existence of this law suggests that there were a lot of free Blacks uh, living in Connecticut as early as 1702. And 
I, I don't know really when the first free black person settled in Windsor, um, but it was probably not long after that law or, or even before that law was passed. Uh, we do know that Moses Mitchell, who was literate, so his story is much different from a lot of the free blacks that we see in the record. Um, he bought his house on Palisado Avenue, not far from the museum here in the year 1791. And his was the first black household north of the Farmington River at that time. Uh, what we don't have from this very early period are any firsthand accounts from any enslaved or free blacks who lived here in Windsor during this period. Um, so that's sort of a disappointment to me because when we do history, we really like to get it straight from the source whenever we can. And we can't do that in this case because we, we haven't found any first person record. So um, in that case, Often what we do is we look at uh, first person resources from other parts of New England. Uh, for example, this book, Complicity, written by Anne Farrow and some colleagues from uh, the Harper Current, goes into great detail about the story of Venture Smith, who was enslaved in the um, coastal area of Connecticut. And we also look at Black Yankees, which is a great look at the experiences of uh, Blacks, both enslaved and free, living in this region. Um, in addition to looking at some more local sources uh, like um, Chavez Hayden, we look at a lot, and also Henry Stiles does a certain amount about Black history in Windsor. Plus, we love Marsha Hinckley's thesis, which you can read on our website uh, if you want to. And these uh, other secondary sources, we have quite a lot of these books available conveniently in the Historical Society's gift shop. I know we have both of these that I'm holding right now and a lot of others. But um, my favorite thing to look at, and I think everybody on staff, we really like to look at the primary source documents. Really good out here. Yeah. So, <laughs> Tom, looking at a lot of those. You want to talk about those first person resources, those primary sources? Yes, definitely. So, um, so, like Kristen said, this this little this little snippet here of Cyrus the Negro, it's the only thing we know about him. However, there are a whole lot of other sources um, that you can find people, evidence of, of any early person, really. Um, and it becomes this sort of you know, piecing together puzzles and uh, it's just this mystery that is so fun to solve. So even though we don't know what happened to Cyrus, we do have a, a, a death record for somebody named Sirius, spelled very similarly, C-I-R-I-O-U-S, who died in 1699 in Windsor. So it's possible they could have, be the same person. Um, there's, you know, no standardized spelling or anything. So there's so many uh, challenges. And this goes with anybody, but especially with the, with, um, the Black population, with, you know, lack of, of surnames and things like that. You really have to um, scour... Um, beyond the usual records that you would that you would look at for any uh anybody doing early history or genealogy and and honestly there's not there's not you know first person accounts from this era are pretty rare for any person so um everybody's always wanted to know like why did my ancestor you know move to Windsor and nobody's I haven't found a diary that's like dear diary this is why I moved to Windsor today that would be great um <laughs> Uh, but it does make the it does make the challenge it doesn't make it a fun challenge and that's what I love. Um, so other kinds of records that we can look at um, besides your usual birth, marriage, death records, um, church records, people uh, we've we've referred. Oh, this is a will. So um, we have another uh, another image, Doug. If you want to move to the um, the next. So this is this is another will of somebody uh, who lived in Windsor a little bit later. Um, Israel Stoughton, and this is in our this is in our collection. We have a, a collection of documents that are old that we call the old documents collection. It's my favorite thing ever. Um, it's just all these random documents. They are not connected to each other, but they're so there's just like gold in here. So um, this says, you know, I give uh, my daughters my Negro man Caesar, um, and uh, you can see it's from 1735. Um, so here again, it's the only time we know about the Caesar. I've tried to follow the daughters and see if they have any, any wills mentioning him, but it's, it's hard to find, uh, you know, 
there's there's not always a record and even if there is a record we don't always have it um but uh so besides stuff like this we've got church records maybe you can go to the next one two um military records so this is somebody we've just jumped ahead in history quite a bit um this is uh an enlistment record sort of written after the fact for uh a free black man named samson cuff uh who enlisted from windsor and um this is sort of uh showing that yes indeed he served his his uh, his his time in the military, and uh, you can see it's from Windsor, and you've got all these Windsor names that everybody who is driven down the street can recognize: Phelps, Philly, Ellsworth. Um, so this is this is pretty phenomenal um, that we have this. There were there were a, a handful, maybe like ten black uh, Revolutionary War veterans who either enlisted from or moved to Windsor after the war. Um, a lot of what I've been um, researching has been following them. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me let me just talk really quickly about a few other records. Um, we've got court records, land records, tax records, account books, and other secondary sources. Um, so you really have to do a lot more digging, a lot more really patient digging, sometimes page by page through things that you normally, you know, <laughs> you really have to dedicate some time. Um, I want to talk about account books uh, real quick because we have a wonderful account book collection in our, uh, in our archives. Um, and I have this, um, we found this amazing record from one of them uh, just recently. So if you go to the next one, so this is an account book for our, uh, a man named Levi Hayden, who you may guess uh, was from the Hayden Station area of town. And um, he uh, he was not a slave owner that we know of, but his father was. Um, and uh, this is, I think, an account book for his business, which may have been a cider mill or something, because he, he sells a lot of cider. And I like that you see he's, he's sold Shad too, but you can see in this book, which has um, listings of different people that he's done business with, it's actually segregated inside the book. So he's got business with a lot of um, the black residents of town. They're all in the back of the book. Um, and you can see here, some of them don't have last names, which to me indicates that maybe they were enslaved. Um, and in this case of this person, George, we know that his name is George Turo because at the bottom it says, oh, I'm going to connect to page 84. And if you go back to page 84, you see George suddenly has a last name and it's George Turo. So what we're looking at here is um, pages from his accounts with Levi Hayden before and after he was emancipated. His emancipation record is in the land records because he's property. So this is, it's, it's just incredible the, the putting together the pieces of this man's life. But my favorite thing that you can see he's getting from Levi Hayden spelling books and summer school rates. I'm not sure what summer school rates means exactly, but clearly he's trying to educate himself, um, you know, ahead of being emancipated, which happens around, I think like 1809 right here. Um, so this, you know, it's just, it's just uh, incredible the things you can find and, and uh, how you can put together pieces of somebody's life from all these disparate sources, um, even if they're not able to uh, write down their own account uh, directly. Um, we do know about George because Levi Hayden's son, I believe, Jabez Hayden, is a, a Windsor historian. He was a big source for a lot of what we know um, about early part of the town. And I know Marsha has a lot to say about, about Jabez Hayden as, a, as one of the key uh, secondary sources. Um, so I, I will let you take over from here, maybe. You're, oh, you're muted. You mean you're going to give me something else to say? One, one of the things that I think is fascinating um, is George Turo's name is very clear here, but his name is spelled variously. And that's one of the challenges that you have in doing research, especially with African-American history. You can look at several different federal censuses and they uh, can be listed spelled differently. Uh, sometimes a person can be listed as white, sometimes black, sometimes as mulatto, sometimes as African. 
So you have to constantly cross reference. But Michelle showed me this the other day and I almost flipped out. It was so exciting because Jabez Hazen writes about him and how he was freed. He was given his property, but part of that deed included the opportunity for, uh, now I'm drawing a blank on his name, it was Phelps, right? For his, his children to be able to buy the property back. So what often happened was relationships with one's uh, enslaved people did not always carry to the next generation. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead even further. Um, Michelle has been doing some really exciting stuff with the early period and, and Kristen. Um, but there, there was movement among people of color uh, during the early time. But um, I'm gonna jump ahead to the Civil War period when there was a significant change. Remember that Windsor's population was very small until it started to grow a lot in the 30s um, and then again in the 50s and 60s. But Windsor's black population really never got over um, just under 5% until the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s. So we're talking about a small percentage of people. But during and after the Civil War, Windsor's population of African Americans jumped by about 61%. So there was less travel from the area and more 75% of the people that came at that time were from the South. Well, we haven't answered the question exactly about why they came to Windsor, uh, what it was specifically, but I believe that since about 12 of Windsor native residents or adopted residents um, fought in the Civil War, once they were allowed to, as of 1862, um, I think they made connections there and came north. Why, again, Windsor, probably because of the agriculture, because tobacco was, we hadn't had shade tobacco yet, but we had uh, um, broadleaf, and I forget what the other kind is, but so they would come for agriculture. We had vegetable gardens, and there were also brickyards. So after the Civil War, um, there were a couple of people, I could get into names, but I guess I should try to keep brief, so I won't, but people that worked together during the 31st Black Regiment, was actually called the Colored Regiment, um, came here, one was from Maryland and one was from um, New York, but they clearly had made some connection. And there was a lieutenant, a white lieutenant from Windsor that came north and with him came uh, a family of color and they became um, very well known in the community, the Scott family and are related to a number of Windsor families through marriage and so forth. So I think that, that uh, Windsor's population grew because of the opportunity for work um, and I don't know why else, because uh, Joseph Rainey came in 1874. Joseph Rainey was the first African-American elected to the uh, House of Representatives of Congress. And he bought a home on Palisado Avenue in 1874. He also brought people north with him, some of the prominent uh, black families. Why he came was probably to escape some of the threats that he had because he was definitely uh, in favor of the 14th Amendment. He was part of the Ku Klux Klan Act. Um, he was for school integration and so forth. And he brought his family probably for safety. I don't think they ever went back South. He died in the South, but I don't think his family did. They ended up moving to Springfield at one point. But anyway, what was it about Windsor that made it a safe place? I don't know, but they came. Um, I wanted to mention also that after the Civil War, there was a competition in the South for jobs that some of the slaves had done. And so this was one opportunity for brickwork. 
So there were people that came north to work at Fort Windsor had 40 brickyards at one point around the Civil War. And uh, later it was primarily the Mac brick and then there were brickyards done in Wilson. But that was one opportunity for people to come here from the south with the trade that they'd already developed and um, work here. I'll tell you that, and then I'll shut up for a few minutes. Maybe there'll be questions and I can go on to the beginning of the 20th century. But um, I was when I was first doing my research, I asked Bill Best, who is Windsor's first black policeman, what jobs they had. And he told me years later that he was really angry with me for asking that question because they said, you know what jobs they had. They basically could have jobs in agriculture and they could have jobs as domestics. So the, the women were primarily at various times were live-in um, service. Sometimes they had their own homes. A lot of the African-Americans had their own homes. We don't know much about them, but they did. Um, but that was, that was the opportunity at that time. And it didn't change much until you get past the 1940s and 50s. So um, let me stop here for a minute and I can talk a little bit about the 20th century when there was another population change, but, but maybe this is enough for the moment. Yeah, I thought maybe this would be a chance also, Marsha, to talk a little bit um, not necessarily you, but to open it up and maybe uh, give um, Rain a chance to talk a little bit too about kind of interpreting this history. And, and one of the things we've done uh, at the Historical Society was taken the Chafee House, and I mention it now because it's really always been interpreted as a, a home of the late 18th and early 19th century residents. Um, and as uh, Kristen mentioned trying to reinterpret that house uh, to share the lives of, and in fact, actually prioritize the interpretation of the lives of the enslaved people that lived in that house with the very wealthy Chafee family. And also we've turned half of that building into an exhibit space uh, or a good portion of it uh, and, and try to show, showcase more contemporary topics in uh, black history and currently have uh, Fiona Vernal's exhibit on the West Indian diaspora uh, called A Home Away From Home in that in that space. And I think, Rain, you were going to talk a little bit about working with school children in that space and some of the things that they brought to, uh, that they took away from what they learned. Absolutely. So, the good thing about the Windsor Historic, there's so many great things about what we, who we are and what we do. This Bond Together exhibition is what brought me to the Windsor Historical Society. Um, and, but especially the, the, the other exhibition that happens simultaneously in that space, which is Home Away From Home. Because as a West Indian American um, first generation, when I heard about Home Away From Home, and I saw, I saw things from my father online, like the cricket from the West Indies. And I just felt I had to be here. And I should call my father when I was here. This is before I started working here. It was just so fascinating. But what Doug is referencing is something that I think he's under the impression. So it does happen inside the house. You have this group of children on a field trip. So we have Nancy Tony who was in so many spaces in the house. So now at first I was talking about one exhibition, which is Home Away From Home. And now I'm speaking about Bond Together. And so here you see in this slideshow, a group of children from a school visiting from South Windsor Middle School. So they're in fourth grade. And here they are learning about different elements of the Chafee House and how the, the people that were bond to the Chafee House that were living there were, you know, they had to take part or they were, that was part of their charge was to help with the service of the doctor which in part makes him a, a very successful doctor in the town of Windsor. So that's the, a piece, this picture shows them doing that. What you don't see in the next image is them learning about Nancy Tony. Her image appears on the wall in the Chafee house. And her name is brought about through just about all of the different five spaces throughout the Windsor, Windsor um, field trip. So we have this complex. So first we have her, one of the images of Nancy Tony is in 
the, um, in the house, but that same group of students then hear her name over and over and over again. And finally, they go to the church and learn her name one more time. And then they take a tour outside of the church to the cemetery where they find her tombstone. And so again, we get a chance to speak about enslavement here in Windsor's historical his history. And we learn, we learn about the challenges that were faced and the amount of grit that was held within this woman. And one of the, one of the students said to me, um, I said, so what do you guys think about that? He said, well, because she was a part of the lower caste. That's why she was treated badly. And I'm sorry, I get chills whenever I get uh, such a, a thoughtful, it's like a personal response. This person, this child knows is identifying something he's bringing to from his own experience, what he knows about this economy, the treatment of people. And he's, he, he identifies her as being from a lower caste. And so I found that to be very, very interesting that uh, students were able to bring themselves to the space to what they were hearing, a name that they were hearing throughout about every site on the tour. And then I was surprised, but I shouldn't have been surprised that once they were leaving the cemetery, you have this group of students just singing, we love you, Nancy Tony. Thank you, Nancy Tony. Goodbye, Nancy Tony. So it's like an impromptu parade. I couldn't have planned a better field trip and a field trip experience. They were doing that themselves. And I just, I, I get, again, I get chills just thinking about how, how much they must have felt how much they must have learned about this woman who really is a big part or represents a big part of American history in general and specifically Windsor history to be specific so that was a very very incredible moment for me that's why I do what I do and so yeah that's the story of Nancy Tony and this group of students great, great. thank you so much <laughs> and uh I wasn't sure, Marsha, where you wanted to pick back up or if we wanted to call, uh, pause. Um, uh, Cassie, for any audience questions and, and, and participant questions or, or comments at this point as well. Yeah, sure thing. I see Judge, you put in the chat, it says that's, a, uh, that's quite a remarkable age for an enslaved person to live, isn't it? So the, that question or that comment is referring to the span of time that she lived being in, as an enslaved person and that was quite a life, a lifetime. And it was a lifetime to that age where she was finally was able to, you know, not be enslaved it was only through the passing, her passing. And so, yes, absolutely. And that's, again, it just speaks loudly about this. this so it's, it's Nancy Tony. I feel like she's a, a known figure here in Windsor, but again, it speaks about like hundreds of people um, beyond Windsor that lived a life from birth to death as enslaved. And I understand that Nancy Tony was not enslaved necessarily based on the, the records that we have found. She was not necessarily enslaved upon her death. And I'll let Kristen or whoever has all, more in-depth knowledge about that but the point is she lived in that sp space of servitude, not having her own space, her own dwelling, her own agency in this lifetime until from birth until her passing. So that is to say, yes, that's a great question. That's a great, great comment. Absolutely. That a lifetime of um, living so or- And Salima, I find, I find it quite interesting that the children can recognize that she was in a caste system. Yeah. Well, I think I think you're referring to Rain, um, yeah. and yes, I think I I thought so too. I, I would, I, yes, I thought so too. And I like I said to Mich I said to Michelle after the, that field trip, I was like, that's a pretty smart comment to make. It's almost like a collegiate level interpretation because there's a book cast cast by Isabella Wilkinson. Yeah. So Isabella was comparing the cast system in India to what we have experienced here in the America in America. And so I know that this student wasn't reading the cast, the book, but they had that, they had that, they had that knowledge of a caste system that now we celebrate, we read these books and it's like they have that understanding. They see the similarities. 
And within a few minutes, I'm talking about 30 minutes or an hour, the whole course was less than an hour um, or two. And within that time, they realized that there is a similarity here that connects them to this narrative. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing, everyone. I see um, Florence, you have your hand up. Would you like to share? Yes. You know, years ago, we did a uh, talk about Nancy Pony and what the judge was just saying about her age. Remember, she was well loved. She lived in the house. You know, she wasn't out in the fields. So she really, even though she was enslaved, she, from what we understand, she was very well taken care of. And if you've ever seen that beautiful painting of her that used to be in Loomis, you know, you can see that there was a lot of love there. So possibly, you know, she never had to go out into the fields and do any really hard work. Not that that's answering it, but it it does make you see why she lived so long. Yeah, I'm trying to think. um, I don't really know off my head an average lifespan for an enslaved person in New England. I don't even know if we have enough data to kind of compile anything like that, because so often we don't know when the enslaved people were born and when they died. So because Nancy Tony has this gravestone, which is a very rare thing for an enslaved person to have had, um, we don't really have the data to know what an average lifespan was. I will say though that um, that um, uh, we have um, some primary source accounts and some secondary source accounts of other enslaved people um, the ones that I'm thinking of, for some reason, they're all actually sort of older side. I, there's a death record in the first church record books for another Caesar, Caesar Negro man of Henry Allen, who died of dropsy age 73, 70 years old in 1803. Um, another person was um, Primus Manumit, who is uh, another name that people might know. He was um, enslaved to a doctor, Alexander Wolcott in town. And um he was also his assistant and learned enough by going around with Dr. Wolcott on his various um, uh, visits to people's houses that he picked up a lot of, of how to be a doctor. So upon his emancipation, um, he moved to East Windsor and started his own practice um, and uh, was known as Dr. Primus Manumit after that. Um, he uh, is described as being in old age when he died. Um, from at least one or two secondary sources. So, um, so it's interesting, like we don't, we don't know what the average life plan is, but I, I do think it's like an, an interesting difference between Northern and Southern slavery and certainly Caribbean slavery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing everyone. I see Judge, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, Maybe you all can answer this. In your research, did you find that a lot of the enslaved people were associated with the area churches like Archer Memorial, First Church, since it's been there for 360 some years? Um, I know there was an account by Pastor Nicole that there were members of first uh, blacks were had to go upstairs and in, into that area i believe in the upstairs balcony i'm not sure i can't quote her on that but has there been any association with the african american community at that time attending churches in the area i i don't know we have definitely have um evidence of um Black people being baptized and things like that in, in First Church. First Church is the oldest one. There's there's a lot of other, um, you know, Archer Memorial didn't really get started until after slavery, as far as I understand it. Um, uh, and we don't, at the Historical Society, don't have as easy access to records from other churches, but we do have a lot of records from First Church. So um, that's the reason I know most about them. But there are... Um, uh, baptisms in there for people who are marked as Negro or mulatto, uh, at least going back to 1740s. Um, and it's it's helpful that they actually, that the, the person writing it down tended to write down if it was a non-white person. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't know. And in fact, we do know that there are some people who did not get marked that way who were known Black people, like the Mitchell brothers, who we mentioned earlier. Um, 
they uh, were a member of First Church, but then they decided to go to different churches. And uh, because you had to pay taxes if you're a member of a church, they it was important to get written down that you are no longer a member of that church. Moses Mitchell wanted to be a Methodist, I think. So he's, he says, oh, I'm deserting from this church. I'm not paying your taxes anymore. Uh, but he didn't get noted as, as, uh, as a Negro or colored or anything like that. Um, so it could be that there's a lot more people that are getting missed because they're not marked that way. Um, well, Michelle, uh, I think we have to remember too that the Congregational Church was the established church until 1818. I mean, they basically were the government of the church, I'm sorry, of the town. And so I know you alluded to Moses and the, and the uh, Methodist Church. He, he and his sister were part of forming the Methodist, Methodist Church. I don't know the dates of that. Um, Archer, as you said, didn't start. I think Michelle um, Rain was going to talk about this a little bit. But uh, there were camp meetings in the Pine Groves very early. But again... And t during slavery anyway, until it was really eliminated in Windsor, not officially by the state or even the country, but um, there were there were people that were gathering in, in different churches, primarily congregational at that during the time of slavery. I've seen one record reference a secondary source saying that there were uh, a few enslaved people who were um, who were uh, part of the Pequannock Church. Ah, um, uh, yeah, and some of them are noted as being enslaved, and some of them just have names that indicate that they probably were enslaved, like Thomas Negro or Cato Rogers. Um, so that's the only, that's only a secondary source, but that's the only indication I've seen of any non-First Church sources. But again, we don't have all the records from all the churches. Marcia mentioned... Uh, Mr. Rainey, and we know that Mrs. Rainey attended First Church at least for a while in the 1880s, because in our collection here we have a quilt, and each quilt square was signed by the ladies of the church. Each lady signed the quilt square, and they gave it as a gift to uh, the minister's wife. And um, Mrs. Rainey signed one of the squares. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say, even though we have all these baptismal records, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were I mean, they weren't members of the church. It was it was a, a different thing to become a member of the church uh, where you had to, I think you had to pay money and do profess your, I'm not really sure, but it, it is a very big difference between um, being a member and just getting baptized uh, as part of the church too. This might be a good time to go ahead and start moving into the uh, uh, 19th and, and 20th centuries and, and, uh, Marsha, did you want to kind of pick up with that thread and, and carry us forward? Sure. I, um, I wonder if Rain wants to say anything about Archer. Uh, it, it, uh, it, I can't remember exact date that it got formed. It was 1897, I think it was. But um, the trolley, which I'd forgotten to mention before, was, was uh, made in, what do we call it? It's 1895. And that created a big shift so that people were able to come to this area from Springfield because the trolley went from Hartford up to Springfield. And so that was one of the reasons that I think Archer formed where it did is because of the population that was in Hayden Station, um, the populations of, of African Americans were really from, from the beginning were sprinkled around town. Primarily in the beginning, um, they were along 159. But then there were people living in um, the center of town. There were people out in Rainbow. But the primary clusters of people were in Cook Hill, which is up near the uh, Bloomfield Avenue ramp to the expressway, and Hayden Station, which is um, on your way to Windsor Locks. Um, but Archer had been meeting with uh, different visiting pastors for a long time. And then finally, some of these people that had moved um, formed the, the church and became a mission um, of the AME Zion Church. I believe it was for, not even formed until like 1827. Um, 
So that was one of the important organizations for African Americans. There had been a Hayden Station Social Club. Blacks were not invited into that. So socially, Blacks and whites didn't mix except for when you were in school and you were a kid. Um, but as adults, they sort of went their separate ways. So um, let me go back to my notes. And, and if I if I could if I could say something about Arch Memorial, why um, Marsha is um, mentioning my interest in them is just because it's such a source of inspiration. Like this is where it's housed, not just praise to God, but also a mission for service, and that's like a part of their from their inception until even when they had like a low with being burn a burning in the space they still kept this message of movement of before the civil rights movement right long before the civil rights movement you have a group of group of people new newly freed still having this idea of service and having different ways to share with the community and i found that to be very fascinating and very inspirational and so of course it's something that i would share with visitors to the historical society that they should look into Arch Memorial as they wish to learn more about the black experience. Because even though we try our best to provide as much in, inclusive, inclusive, inclusive experiences as possible, it's very, very great to be able to get to the source and Arch Memorial is still there, still kicking, still doing the good work and still housed it being a house of this great legacy of civil rights or civic rights, let's say, or however you want to call it, and the spiritual all coming together. Where it could that be done any better? We do know what the first church, from the information I know, and forgive me for rambling, it does seem to be um, divided where everyone had to go, of course, the enslaved had to join their, the people that were enslaving their, them. But from what I understand, they had to sit in the balconies and back to the school group that came and we actually went up to the balcony. I said, how do you guys think that the enslaved people would have felt? And just for their own interpretation, they said, one, one student said, I think it would have been, it would have been happy because they were get to be by themselves. So I'm not sure, I can't, I can't say that that person is wrong. And that's why I think these kind of in, um, conversations are great because it allows students to have their own interpretation about history. We provide them what we know and it gives them an experience where they, with their own lived experiences are valued. Just like the same way that we're having conversations, my job with students is to allow them to have conversations when it comes to feelings and ideas of how people at a certain, a certain time might have felt. I know I took us away from Archer um, and I don't mind going back into Archer if, Mar if Mark used to have something else to show about, share about this amazing um, institution. And real quick, I know an audience member messaged me. Um, Nicole, would you like to share real quick um, some of your uh, insight? Go ahead. Oh, you're muted. You got to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Cassie. So for those who don't know, I'm the um, pastor at First Church. So, And I also just share a huge love of history and um, have looked into some of these questions myself, both with my own research and um, at First Church. So, but I just wanted to say in general, even though like what we hear about congregational churches and it being the kind of the state church, there were a lot of outliers and there was a lot of diversity in congregational churches. So one of the things, I don't believe that First Church was an abolitionist church, but there were abolitionists, I think, or people that were not, it's different being an abolitionist than being anti-slavery, let's just say. And so I do think that there were people, um, so one of the things when you see a black or mulatto person in the church records as a member, um, it's kind of a, um, I don't know, it's kind of a radical thing at that time for, a, for um, people of color to be seen as full members of the church and to be be permitted to marry and to have, um, because if you are a full member, that means that you are part of, believed to be elect of God. 
And so we did have that at First Church. I'm not saying it was the the best, uh, you know, they were progressive by any means, but um, I do think theologically at the time that that was a very big deal. Um, And so that means that, you know, before that marriages were recognized, um, full membership you could um, serve. Um, But I think the fact that some first black first church members ended up joining and being part of the Archer AME founding did show that um, that their gifts were not fully utilized or celebrated because um, the AME Zion denomination as a whole was founded by black members whose gifts were not allowed to be used fully in white churches. And so I think it's really, I think we can assume that that was the case. And I also think it's pretty amazing that little old Windsor, I mean, this was, as Marcia said, and this was like a, a, not a very big place. The denomination was forming in New York City, and yet they sent a pastor to form a, a, um, a, a AME Zion church in Windsor which shows that there was probably a really strong community here, um, which I think is uh, probably from those camp meetings. And this has been going on for a while. So I'm really interested in what was going on religiously um, with uh, in Windsor. And I think um, it's been, it's, it's not uniform. It's um, there's a lot going on there. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Let me jump in again, because one of the things that um, I learned from Bill Best too was there were a lot of people, Nicole, that did not leave the congregational church. They may have supported the Archer Church, but they didn't want to leave. The church had been good to them. And I think it, in some ways it typifies some of the relationship that there re- my sense was that there was real, in general, this is probably not true everywhere, but in general, there were close relationships between the African-Americans and the whites. They were never socially equal, but there were close relationships. The congregational church, when the Archer Church burned down, um, I don't remember the date of that, but it was early on. Um, Bill was alive, so it was after 1924. But um, the congregational church loaned them the building that they have up on Hayden Station Road, which I think is still there. And they also helped them financially build the church that they built to replace it. So they also picked up the kids to take them to the church. So they would go up to Hayden Station, pick up the kids and take them down to church. So there was a very supportive relationship and um, Bill's family never left the, the congregational church. Although again, it, it, they were not, I don't believe, considered equals, but it's, that's, that's really an important connection and a support of, of another denomination. So it was great. Yeah. Just want to very quickly mention, uh, you know, we're fortunate in Windsor to have a very active Freedom Trail organization and a number of important uh, sites and houses uh, to kind of echo what Rain and Marsha have been talking about and and the earlier comments about Joseph Brainy, uh, that those are all sites on the Freedom Trail and places where people can not necessarily go in to everyone, but can learn more about it. So I'm going to ask, maybe we can start to move forward into the 19th. And, and Marsha, I think you're going to carry us into the 20th century. So it's a heavy burden, a uh, hundred years of history in about five minutes. But uh, I'm sure that if anybody can do it, you can. So <laughs> if you can help us move. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But I will jump ahead. And um, there are a couple of things that I, it, it's hard to, hard to be brief because there are so many good things. And Michelle has had these wonderful pictures of, of uh, classes. Um, and I think you'll notice that if you look closely enough that they are integrated with the one or two African-American children who are present but there was a state law in 1868 that they needed to be integrated. Um, I'm going to quick and just mention that these are colorized. I did this with computer magic. They weren't actually in color. They're black and white pictures that I colorized. Just want to throw that in there. And there's some other ones that are colorized later in the slideshow too. 
or whatever. One of Little Billy Best that's not in this one, though, and it's one of my favorites. But um, the white population changed dramatically after 1900, too. There were Eastern Europeans that came, that, and then, um, then there was the suburbanization movement. And this was really participated in by both black and white. So um, with the trolley, again, people could move to Windsor, find a place to live and still work in Hartford. There was a close connection with Hartford and in terms of churches as well. So um, the Lees, for example, Audrey Lee, Audrey was a man. Um, he laughs at how he had to deal with that name. But um, his family came north from Georgia, basically part of the beginning of the Great Migration of, of African Americans to the north. And then they went first to Hartford, then came into Windsor because his, his father said, you can't raise kids in the city. And Audrey would go on to say, and he was right. <laughs> so, but he said, you have to remember that when he came here in the early 20s, um, Windsor was very rural. And the schools were not as good as the ones in Hartford, but they could own property. And so that was one of the reasons they came. Um, the Joneses came as well. The Joneses came up to cook. Audrey moved to Wilson, the Wilson area. And um, the Joneses moved up to the Cook Hill Road area. And I don't know whether Florence remembers them, but I think she does. The Joneses, I believe, had a huge, uh, whatever you call it, um, in their gardens, the bushes had the name Jones made into the, the shape of the gardens. But they came also because they're, they're, um, they wanted to own property. And they also became very engaged with the community. So Audrey was on the Democratic Town Committee. He was uh, chair of the commission that put the Decker Brook uh, and encased the Decker Brook. Um, and uh, Narcia Jones, who was the daughter of a slave and in, in, an enslaved person in North Carolina, was very active. She convinced the Board of Education that they should have school buses for the kids that um, she uh, taught people how to can during World War II so that they could um, save money and, and have their food. She collected uh, war bonds and so forth. And she was, I don't know if you have the slide of her, but she was recognized for all the work that she did on the cover of Homestead magazine. And the family was oh, very okay. um, uh, supportive of the whole community. This is another thing that shows how they supported each other within the constrictions of the white community. The jobs were not equal, but they wanted them to excel and feel proud of themselves and retain their dignity. So um, they had kids come over. The Joneses had kids come over and play ping pong. They had ping pong tournaments. They played baseball around the community. Um, they, um, let's see, they um, had lawn parties. And so they, they made a lot of fun for themselves, even though things were not equal. Um, the elder Jones boy left the area, went down to Washington, D.C. in order to get a, a non-demeaning job. And Dr. Winston, who um, you may have read about it in the uh, Historical Society newsletter, she earlier than that had gone down to Washington, D.C. To, to be able to find work. So there was not equality, but um, Bill Best would say, I'm not going to complain because I had a happy childhood. So I wanted to, if I could, I know I've skipped a whole bunch of stuff and I want Salima not to, she, she's got some critical stuff to share here. But I just wanted to share a little bit because I think part of what we wrestle with, and I still wrestle with how to present this, um, I'm a white person, so I can't speak for a person of color, but I tried very hard to hear what what people of color were saying. Now they're saying it to a white person, so I have to also filter it through that. But um, 
what what I understood about relationships between blacks and whites, other than the, the constrictions that were everywhere, was uh, here's a quote: "We felt it. We knew it was there, but it did not discourage us. We just went on with it." And then Audrey Lee said, you had to live it or fight it the best way you could. You could be submissive or you could be boisterous or antagonistic, but that didn't do you any good. It didn't pay you to walk around with a chip on your shoulder because someone would knock it off sooner or later and you might have troubles. So you just go along and notice things and act accordingly. And then Bill Beth said, I'm not bitter because I had a chappy, happy childhood. So... I'm going to leave that floating there because I have a feeling that Salima has gathered some really fascinating things from people that she's interviewed during this centennial. And I'm sorry for all of the stuff I'm having to skip. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a, a different range of things. And I think one of the questions which we haven't officially um, displayed yet, but it's about why Windsor has changed over the last 50 years specifically. And I think one thing that came up a few times was the concept of racial steering. And that's kind of directing people of color specifically to a specific region. And um, a few individuals have kind of hinted towards that idea that when they were looking for homes initially, Windsor was one of the places that they were suggested to move to, along with Bloomfield, which is important to note because there seems to be some sort of similarity between Windsor and Bloomfield in terms of demographics. But yes, there were some people who said there were streets in Windsor and areas of Windsor that were kind of designated for the black residents. And I know Marsha, you had mentioned Cook Hill Road, which I think um, was very prominent in terms of black residents. And there were a few others, we talk about Hayden Station and I'm not sure of the specifics, but yes, there's several interviews about, you know, looking at different homes and, you know, the real estate agent would say, this home might be better suited for you. And it would just so happen to be in a specific area of Windsor. And so that kind of plays into the idea of integration, but in a way that is still separate. So we have in, in other areas as well, just pockets of people of color. And even though they are in Windsor and they're, you know, changing the demographic of Windsor, there isn't always that intermingling. And there are some different cases that are the complete opposite of that. I previously interviewed a woman named Victoria Brown who has a very extensive history in Windsor. She was related to Floyd Niles, who is a brick maker in town and is a notable Windsor resident, I'd say. And she grew up on a road with only three other homes and for the remainder of her life in Windsor, or for the, the majority of her life in Windsor, her family was the only black family on her street. So instead of being in a primarily black neighborhood, she was in a primarily white neighborhood. And there's experiences like that on both ends of the spectrum. So we've had another individual, her name is Mary J. Saunders. Her interview is actually available on our YouTube channel and she talks about living on a primarily black street. I cannot remember the name of the street right now, but she does talk about planes flying over in the morning to kind of dust the tobacco fields, I believe, and how the experience there might've been different than having lived on a primarily white street. Um, in terms of our other centennial interviews, I would recommend listening to Gladys Jackson's interview. She talks about her experience in Windsor, also moving to a primarily white street and how when she first arrived, the, the neighbor, neighborhood was quiet, but then in the process of moving in, there was, it was almost, it almost became a spectacle, you know, the, the black family moving in. And so a lot of the other residents were gathered outside in the park to watch the process of them move in. And she stated that after that day, she never saw that many people playing in the park ever again. And I think that speaks to the experience in Windsor at certain points. And so 
I think overall with the oral history interviews, it's been a great way to get a sense of Windsor's black history because the best way to tell history is to listen to the people who've experienced something firsthand. And so even though there's different ranges of black history, even on screen, we have Nichette Blackburg, whose story is a different time period from Gladys Jackson, but they both speak volumes to the Black Windsor experience, and there's always something to learn from all of them. Very cool. And the, what's on the screen is just a snapshot from our website. Salima has been transcribing these various interviews and, and putting them all up on YouTube so people can actually listen to the firsthand accounts that she's referenced. And we have 56 interviews from our centennial alone, plus a, a number of others that some have been done in the past and others uh, Salim is working on now. So uh, we've got quite a bit of history uh, in audio format that people can, can listen from. And the judge looks like he, uh, you have a question or a comment? Well, yes, a comment. Um, I just wanted to say my experience when I first moved to Windsor, uh, I think it was 2013 or 14, 14. Um, I moved into a house in, on Palisado, 736 Palisado. And it was the home of Dr. Clotian Brayfield. And she was very much a civil rights advocate. And I think that spurred me into becoming a part of the Human Relations Commission um, and social justice and racial justice. And living in that house, I had the, I have the farmer's books of the people that lived there before. And I got to meet her children who were at that time, she was a teacher in Bloomfield and she moved her family to Windsor in order for them to have equal rights and, you know, not, not be in such a segregated community because her children were half black and half white. Um, and I'm just, I was just very moved. And I think that moved me to be a part of this community more so because I lived in that huge house, which was about 3,500 square feet, which is why I moved away from it too, because um, the oil bill was killing me. But, uh, you know, that house has a lot of history in it. And I still have the farmer's books from when he used to sell meat and the farm, the, the area behind that, that house used to be a sod farm before you get to the Connecticut River. And I just, I pass by the house now and the house is listed in, on Wikipedia uh, uh, as places, historical places in the United States. And if you Google the house 736 Palisado, you'll see my name referenced in there with other people that have lived there. I love that house. And I think it's the reason why I can't leave Windsor. But I thank you for letting me say that. <laughs> that's great. And that's, you know, we've kind of jumped ahead into the second question, as Salima noted, which is really just uh, noting, as Marsha fast forwarded us through history very nicely, uh, from a point where the Black population in Windsor was always 5% or less for hundreds of years. Uh, and then the transformation in the late 20th century to a point where today uh, about 38 percent of Windsor's population identify as black. Uh, it is also a population now that includes a large number of Latinx and Asian and, and other ethnicities. Uh, and the white population that used to be 95 percent is now uh, 48 percent or fewer uh, of the population. So it's a, a demographically very uh, diverse uh, community, but um, one of one of the oral histories I got to do, not to take any of, of Salima's thunder, but uh, was with Tim Curtis, uh, former deputy mayor, who uh, in his closing remarks to his interview said, you know, Doug, Windsor is a wonderful community. It's very diverse, um, but it is not yet an inclusive community. Uh, and I think some of what Salima is pointing out is, is that, you know, those issues still persist uh, today uh, and often as a white person, you're oblivious to that, right? That's what we call white privilege. We don't experience that 
uh, but it, through history and understanding uh, and listening to people, we can understand better even our own time as well and people that are living now. So it's uh, an important way for us to get at that, I think, through historical work. So I'd, I'd like to um, open it up, too, for other people that have uh, things. I know our, our uh, both our Historical Society staff and Marsha had a lot of things to say. We knew we had more things to say than we had time for. Uh, but if there are things that we kind of glossed over that people wanted to bring back out, this would be a great time to do that. Uh, or members of, of the, the audience that had things they wanted to share as well, because some of you have shared things with us uh, in recent past uh, that uh, I know are also very relevant. Good, Lars. Great. First of all, I would like to say thank you all so very, very much. This is so exciting. And, you know, we have, I think Doug's head is going to probably blow off soon because he has really, in just the two years, opened so many doors. I was part of the Windsor Afro-American Civic Association, and that was basically started by Willie Graham, who worked for Senator Dodd, but it was to get uh, scholarships for kids at the high school because there were no scholarships for black kids. So that's how it all started. But because we wanted to get more involved and be uh, non, a nonprofit sort of thing, you know, and not be so political, that's why it became an organization that mm -hmm. anyone could join. We did have white members, but it was a time when it was like we were starting, you know, and now when I think what's going on now with Salima and, and Michelle and everyone at, at the uh, Historical Society, we could set the world on fire. So I think we still have a chance. It's just getting all those people out there involved. And I think it's a good start what the Historical Society is doing now. And Cassie, I just love having you around all the time. Remember you as a little girl running around, you know, but it's just, this is what we need is for people to know that, um, there's a pop, there is a chance. And unfortunately, I even talk to a lot of my white friends and or I talk to everybody, but people always feel as though they need to apologize. But Marsha, you don't have to apologize. You didn't do anything wrong. And I feel this way, whatever happened, we talked about this in church this morning with uh, Harriet Tubman. And because she couldn't read or write, you know, she has uh, problems her entire life, but she got so many people out of slavery, but she had someone read to her every day out of the Bible and she learned, learned, learned to quote. So I said, you know, we go all the way back to the beginning when they came here, you know, as Christians to save the world. And as a little girl in Sunday school, I used to always say, if they love Jesus, why did they hate black people? So I think we're still learning, you know, and we're going back a long time. So everybody should just be so proud of themselves, everyone who's involved in this, because every day you're opening more doors and more people are learning. I just, I'm like you, a judge. I love Windsor. <laughs> Thank you. Florence, thanks so much. You know, one of the things we really, we, we, start with the story of slavery because it is where often the black story begins in North America. But we really feel it's important at the Historical Society to get to uh, what else was happening in the lives of black people here in Windsor, uh, both the free blacks at the time of slavery's uh, existence and, and since then. And you mentioned the the Windsor Afro-American Civic Association, WACA, and thanks to Florence, we're, we're getting into, and it's a very uh, contemporary topic, uh, getting into that through oral histories. And, and Salima's done a ton of work with that uh, project. We've got some great plans for that too. Do you want to talk a little bit, Salima, about what we're doing and, and what we hope to do with that? Yeah, so with the with our Afro American Civic Association, or we like to say WACA, um, we're trying to create an exhibit to tell the history of the organization, and we're reaching out to previous members to kind of get a sense of what the organization looked like, and that could be in terms of membership and the events that were held. There were 
large amount of events that were held some annually. Uh, first that comes to mind is the annual celebration of the Black experience, which is just a really exciting way to get the community involved. And like Florence had said, these events were open to anyone. And so I think that was a great way to just spread a message about Black history and celebrate it in a way that's welcoming for everyone. So with the walk exhibit, we're also trying to collect physical artifacts and give an idea of what the organization did. And also like Florence was saying, there were some scholarships that were offered for students and we're trying to look into finding those students and seeing how that scholarship changed their life possibly. And even the people who were sponsored by WACA for the Shad Derby pageant, I think those people also would have a lot to say about what WACA offered them. And overall, it's just, you know, seeing how this civic association really shaped Windsor and got involved in so many different ways because members were not only active in this organization, but they were active all throughout the town and they participated in town council and had connections with the police athletic league and the town commission. There's just an endless list of ways that they got involved. So it seems like WACA was almost a starting point for some people to just branch out or even vice versa, already being involved in the town and finding another place to, to work on and help students. And yeah, I think the exhibit would be a great way to you know tell the history of the organization and recognize the stories that might not be told on an everyday basis. And our, our goal is to open the Waka exhibit. So we've got a lot of work to do uh, between now and December, but December in the Chafee House, we hope to have that there for, for people to come see. And um, one of the other things we wanted to talk about this segment, and, and I'm gonna go ahead and start that and, and hope that others will feel free to jump in, was our um, uh, kind of how you can learn about Windsor's Black history on an ongoing basis. We, we talked about the Freedom Trail already uh, as a great source. And some of the things that we've developed, and, and again, you know, Florence, you're very kind, but uh, this, this is everybody on our staff and many people in the community have contributed to this. And uh, the foundation of our new Black History webpage really is uh, Marsha Hinckley's thesis which she kindly allowed us to scan in for the first time in 30 years. We have a digital copy. People can go and read it. And if you want to learn about Windsor's Black history, then that is the first place you should start is to go and, and read her thesis on our website. But we also have all kinds of other great things. Um, we, we have lots of articles. We also, as we've mentioned, have our, our oral history interviews. Um, as Salima mentioned, our newsletter, often the newsletter articles, Michelle puts them up on the website so you can read about them as, as pieces of, of historical information as well. Uh, and if you're a member of the society, you get our newsletter. So uh, you get to see it before it gets put on the website. And then throughout our exhibit spaces, we are working to really do a better job of telling the story of all Windsor residents. Um, one of the Pretty important things that happened uh, just in, in my tenure here of only two years, in addition to the pandemic, which we won't talk about that, but uh, on the, the murder of George Floyd sparked protests and observances all over the country. It also sparked a lot of municipalities to declare racism as a public health crisis. And Windsor, uh, which loves to be first, right, uh, first town, was also the first town to declare racism a public health crisis in first town in Connecticut. So uh, that's something that we felt was notable uh, in, in pulling that out as part of our history. And then no visit to a museum is complete without a, a visit to the gift shop, right? And, and gift shops are, yes, right, gift shops are a way to extend your experience in learning. So take, whether it's taking a gift home or something like that or a book. And we have really dramatically expanded our gift shop uh, thanks to Sue Tate Porcaro and many others. Uh, and you can now come and, and if, if you can't find the book you're looking for on African-American, Latinx, or indigenous history, let us know and we'll order it and we'll get it on the shelf for you. But uh, we have a, a ton of new material, some of which we've talked about already tonight. 
uh, and hope you will. And then programming. Uh, Rain has been coordinating some programming that really is first of kind for us and very consistent with the new direction we identified in our strategic plan, which was we've been doing for decades, as Michelle said, we've been doing a great job with helping white people uh, do their genealogy. Um, uh, relatively few people of color have found uh, the Windsor Historical Society is the place that meets their needs, and we are trying to change that so that people can come uh, and find that they're meeting their needs, too, and finding whether it's Caribbean or Southern uh, United States or African, uh, they can research that. And so we just wrapped up a three-part series with Sandra Tate Eady, who's a renowned international genealogist, and we'll probably be doing a lot more with her. And then also helping, not just celebrating during February uh, Black History Month, but also ensuring we do celebrate during February Black History Month, uh, a great program down at the Rec Center in Wilson uh, called Jumping for Our Dreams, featuring Double Dutch Jump Rope. Uh, and uh, that was a, a cool program and got a lot of participation and really highlighted an aspect of African-American culture that uh, people don't always think about, um, but is... I think uh, we we tapped into some people who are trying to revive that in, in the culture as well. So uh, those are some of the things that we're doing. It's a long-term process for us to change an organization and how we interpret history uh, and what we call doing history more inclusively. Uh, and, and we look forward to people in the community helping us with that. One of the things we will be doing more of, and some on this screen are involved in, is reinterpreting the Chafee House. Um, and we're asking some members of the community to come together and help us to look at that building, look at the stories that could be told there and help us define how we can use the Chafee House as a museum of perhaps the region's black history or a museum of multicultural history, uh, which does not exist in this area. Right? We all know about the Amistad Center, but there really are no other museums where you can come learn about the area's Black history. And uh, that's something that we hope to be able to do. So I've, I've said way too much. <laughs> I'm hoping others will have things they'd like to add. If people want to contact you for the Loomis Chafee House, where should we contact you, Doug? Or yeah, the organization? Yep. Just... Um, we all have a very lengthy email address because the last part of it, the domain name is windsorhistoricalsociety.org, but you can contact us at info at windsorhistoricalsociety.org or D. Shipman. Uh, and, and the same is true, everybody on this, uh, the staff, it's first initial last name at windsorhistoricalsociety.org. And we would love to talk with you. And I think most of the people on this call already know how to reach us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, I did want to say, um, Doug, if you could go back up to the to the photos, um, I'm, I'm the 2D person, as, as Kristen said, photos fall under my uh, purview. So um, so I love them. And I have been, you know, uh, focusing a lot of my efforts on uh, digitizing a lot of our of our uh, our print photo collections. These are all colorized again, by the way, <laughs> computer magic. Um, uh, I just I just sort of put them up there to show sort of a diversity of, of uh, different kinds of um, life in Windsor, uh, you know, that uh, we have uh, in terms of photographic evidence from the early 20th century. Um, I like the one on the bottom right, especially because it's from our tercentenary um, and I didn't really even notice that the person on the right was was a black person until I had it colorized and then he, he suddenly popped right out. And um, it's just phenomenal to me that um, this this sort of thing was happening. But I think that it's, it's also uh, interesting to me because so much of what we have in our collections comes from uh, the, the white population. So I'm, I'm pretty the top right photo actually comes um, from D. Jubri. Um, whose family has been in Windsor for a very long time. One of the oldest, I think, black families in town. I think Marsha's trying to say something, but she's muted. Uh, but um, but uh, yeah, the top right one is they were itinerant um, photographers, which I didn't know was a thing before, but in the early 20th century, late 19th century photographers. 
uh, would go town to town. Not everybody had a camera in their pocket. It's a big clunky thing. So they would take pictures of people, especially in front of their houses, um, and then sell them, sell the prints to those to those people. And the top left one is is just amazing. It's a family uh, on the island, which is now the Loomis Chafee School of Campus. Um, uh, it's one of my favorites. It's glass plate negative. It's gorgeous. But anyway, um, all that is to say, uh, part of what I've been trying to do in addition to getting our collections digitized and made available is, is um, ask the Windsor community for, uh, you know, artifacts like this, that we can help um, really fill in a lot of the blanks, really try to tell more of a complete story of Windsor's history. Uh, obviously doing um, the oral histories it's a huge part of, of that. Um, but of course, we can't get oral histories from all of these, you know, people who lived a lot longer ago. So that's, that's part of my goal is to try to help with um, from the collection side of it, get more of these kinds of materials that can help us with our interpretation of, of Windsor's history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much for sharing, Michelle. Randy, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. One is that I mean, Historical Society, I, I, I see and I know is doing really good work. And I just wanted to, 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 maybe just to say, even just for myself, is that what the Historical Society is doing is not what the town is doing. And I think that's separate. So I couldn't tell you today what the town is doing about race and diversity. Um, I'm not sure, um, other than the council approving a, um, you know, a, uh, a statement about racism being a public health history, I mean, a public health issue, I can't say what the town has done since then. So I just want to point out that we're doing, I think we're doing really good work here and we're reaching out to all the parts of Windsor, but that's not the same as the town doing it. So to me, something that needs to, we need to keep in, our, in the back of our mind is what are we doing to either pull the town along with us or push the town? Um, because these, these things are not the same. And I think someone said earlier about, you know, they had a friend and they weren't looking for somebody to apologize to black people. I don't think anybody is. I think what we're looking for is acknowledgement what's happened and what continues to happen. I think that's really important. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that, that let, let's separate what we're doing here and what the town's doing. Not to say the town's not doing anything, but I don't know that I could actually point out what they're doing. And I know that the commission is a committee of the town, but that's not the town government. So. I just wanted to kind of point that out because I don't I, I see them as separate. Right now I do. Maybe it won't be in the future, but I still see um, that they're not going along as fast or as far as historical society is. Andy? Can I, Kathy, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, one of the things that I have felt here is that in Windsor, in my 50 years here, is that the conversation on race has gone just so far and then it stops. And, and I, what I'm hoping is that um, the Windsor Art Center, I've told you before, is, is very much in, in, you know, in sync with, with what Doug's doing, but not as directly. Um, but I'm hoping that what's happening at the Historical Society will start conversations and the more people that are talking, the more this is going to, I hope, influence what happens in our town government. So as we all get more educated, I don't know, because I, I have felt that there is this place of, and, and Kevin, or sorry, Judge, maybe you've noticed that too, but I, I think it's exciting that these conversations are happening that are not part of the government that will eventually affect it. So I don't know whether that's true, but I'm putting that out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Marsha and Randy. I see a couple more hands are coming up. So Agnes, why don't you go first? Um, yeah, just really one thing, even just to remind everybody that the Winter Historical Society started talking about this a number of years ago. 
and and it was a matter of our discussion on that that went from there to um, trying to do an analysis to find our next executive director. Okay, so it started before Doug, and the reason why he was hired was because those conversations were there. We have to really keep in mind, and I think everybody has to keep in mind, and I appreciate what Randy said. I would love to take some people in a town of Windsor and shake them, um, but this is a long-term strategy. We're planting the seeds and saying, come along with us. I'm not exactly We're trying. sure what the expectation is that the town would do. Good point, Janet. You know, what is the expectation? What 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 do we want <laughs> the town to do about this? Um, I I I don't know what we want the town to do about this. But what we're doing is, and I keep saying that, is I can only control what's within my purview. And that's just right here. And hopefully, if I walk the talk and everybody else walks the talk, we're going to make a difference. But it's a long-term strategy. It's not something that happens overnight. And I know 400 years is a terrible time. Um, but then again, there are a lot of us that are really dumb and take a long time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Thanks so much for sharing, Agnes. When you were sharing that, it kind of reminded me of the book called Each Kindness, how like each, each of our sentiments are kind of like the rocks or little seeds that make ripples. But over time, ripples fade and you have to keep putting it in and keep keep walking the talk as you said so thank you so much for sharing that i see judge you want to share something next sure um i've been the chair of this commission for i think this is going on my sixth year and i'm committed to what i do on this commission and educating and that's the reason for this series the series started maybe two years ago now and we keep having these conversations because i keep putting this forward and i keep hoping that more people will bring people onto these conversations so that they will be aware and know what is going on and what they can do and how they can make a change uh it is vitally important in my soul that just like someone said you know i can only control what's in my purview and yes, I'm, uh, yes, this commission is a part of the town, but we are, it, as long as I'm sitting as chair, and I think uh, as well as the other commissioners that are on the commission, we want to see the change. And we are the reason for the change. And we're putting that forward to the community, but they need to be instructed on where to go for guidance because a lot of people are not aware of where they need to go to read a book or to learn about history from the Windsor Historical Society. We are a diverse community, but yes, we have a lot of problems. And I've had this discussion with Pastor Nicole. I've had this discussion with Marsha. I've had a limited discussion with, with Doug about this. And it's, it's a lot of work. And there are a lot of tentacles to this work. So as I promised this year, I, I want to be more diverse in my programming. Because the only way that we can learn about each other is we participate. And the more, the better way we can do that is that the people on this call can inform people on the next, about the next event that is coming up, whether it's the Human Relations Commission, the Windsor Historical Society, the Windsor Arts Center, or whatever, First Church, uh, Grace Church, Archer Memorial, you have to get involved if you want to make a change. And people will not follow unless you give them something to, to follow. So we are the people that are leading this fight. And people like Nujet Black Burke and, and, and Jody Terranova and Lisa Bess and you know all these people combined, we can only 
lead so many people because there are so many tentacles to this fight. And I'll <laughs> shut up now. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Judge. Those are some powerful sentiments. Um, I know I saw Rain. Did you want to share real quick and then we'll go to New Shet? I just, thanks. I just I put my hand down because I think that Judge does answer the question, but just to put it out there that I was thinking like, what are the specific issues that at, um, Randy, because I feel like it's a, a very real um, question that you or observation that you put out there. You feel like you have a place to share your your, your thoughts or your concerns where your voice is being heard, um, whether it's with this. You said the historical society is doing a good job, but beyond there, do you feel like there are spaces for the town, someone like you, to be able to share your concerns, and do you feel heard in any spaces beyond the spaces that are, are like identified here or or in this meeting, basically? Do you feel like you have a place where you can share and do you feel like you're being heard? This is for Judge Washington and anyone else who feels that there are things about this town that are not, you know, in accordance to where we want it to be. It's a lot. <laughs> is Randy still around? Go ahead, Randy. Um. Yeah, yes, I do. I mean, for instance, I attend the Board of Education meetings, right? My kids are out of school, but I have grandkids that go because it's important. And I know there's, they still deal with cultural diversity and race and all those kinds of things. And I go to not only support my grandkids, but also to support the Black male superintendent, right? So... I do those things and it's, and I'm saying these things not because I don't know where to go and, you know, I don't know how to get, I can pick up a phone call and I can get to who I need to get to. But if we're doing this as a, but the, the council, I mean, I don't know how many of you attend count town council meetings, you know, or board of ed meetings. Those things are really important to know what's going on. Um, and if, You know, I, I see Nichette's there, but I but in all the times that we've had that uh, the judge has had these kinds of meetings, I could probably count on one hand the number of council people who've attended any of these things. So other than almost a pre-selected group, who else is hearing? Who's reporting all the kinds, you know, the great things that we're doing um, through the historical society? And, you know, it, it's just, I know, but I think that unless we connect it to the community, how will we ever make change? We could discuss here all day, all we come up with all the answers, but at some point it needs to get beyond us. Hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing, um, Randy and Rain. Um, Nushet, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, good evening to everyone. And I joined a little bit late as I was at another event, but definitely did not want to miss this. And um, Mr. McKenney, definitely hear what you are sharing. And you know what I find interesting about racism is a public health crisis. When you think about, you know, what is a health crisis, right? It's, you know, and Dr. Turnover is here, so she'll correct me if I'm saying this incorrectly, but it's something that impedes folks from being healthy. Like it, it's become so chronic that it's impeding health, it's impeding growth. And so what I'm grateful for is that, yes, in June of 2020, um, the declaration was made, but from the perch that I'm sitting in and for living in Windsor for all 45 of my years, except when I was in college, I've never seen this level of dialogue. And while it has made some individuals uncomfortable, I think it's almost like having a wound and getting all of the stuff like out of it. And once the stuff is out of it, and I don't can't say where all the stuff is out of the wound yet, but it's definitely taking time to get some of that conversation going so people can understand. I do agree we have a ways to go. Would I like to see more people engaged to Randy's point? But I'm so grateful that we have started the conversation. And I also um, caution folks that the declaration was not something and across the state we've had this conversation with other towns 
it wasn't like a checklist or a check a box that you have to do all these things in order to justify um, the declaration or the resolution that was passed. But it was more about how are we addressing the systemic pieces that are affecting our community? So for me, that is the next step. How are we really dismantling some of those systemic pieces that are here amidst our wonderful Windsor? And so by having these types of conversations, the Historical Society, um, myself and Dr. Tara Nova and Deputy Mayor Bress on the town council, we are constantly trying to ensure that conversations are happening so folks can continue to learn and address the chronic piece that's here as far as racism, racism is concerned. So just wanted to add that piece that I'm grateful that we're here because for 45 years of living in this town, I don't recall us having such candid conversations about things like racism or even race. So just wanted to add that piece. Judge Washington, like you said, I'll be quiet now, but thank you everyone and definitely have enjoyed the dialogue. Absolutely, thanks so much for sharing me, Shet. Anyone else have any um, comments or things that they would like to add? I just want to say real quickly, Cassie, uh, I really appreciate Nichette joining us tonight. Uh, she is one of the uh, public uh, leaders that has agreed to be on our uh, exploratory committee for the Chafee House uh, and look forward to getting that process started and, and hearing uh, all the things people have, because I think historical societies in any town uh, can really be the embodiment of civic pride uh, if they're done well. Uh, and can also stimulate, you know, help to stimulate some of the conversations that need to be had about our history, uh, you know, long ago, as well as, as not that long ago. And, and so we hope that as the historical society, we could be part of the solution uh, and, and not be part of the problem as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Doug. Um, Agnes, I see your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make one comment. Um, that's what I said the last time. Um, the one thing that that has struck me more than anything else, uh, not that I I haven't believed in this from before and engaged in it, but after Doug came and he had the oral history thing with Tim. Now I've known the Curtises going all the way back to when my John was involved in town council and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, but the one thing that, Tim, and the reason why we moved here was because of the diversity. And the one thing Tim said to Doug that I think I'd love to see Jody and Nuchette take back to the town council was the last comment that he said which was Windsor is wonderful and it is, we love it. You know, we love it. We love this town. I'm here because I wanna be here and not in 80 degree weather. Um, and it is beautiful because it's so diverse, but it's not inclusive. And I think that's what we need to think about. And I think that's what Randy and all of us have begun to really think about is we don't we aren't thinking about diversity anymore we're now thinking about inclusiveness what does it mean to make somebody feel included you know you get someone on your board of directors how do you keep them on the board of directors you know we don't want tokens we want we want people who are there to be there and to stay there and I think it's the word, we have to stop thinking about diversity so much as we have to start thinking about inclusiveness. How do we make people included? I would like Cheryl and Tim to come back and say, yeah, I feel like we're becoming more inclusive. That would mean a great deal to me. We aren't there yet and I know Tim wouldn't say that yet. So I'll shut up now. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing, Agnes. When you were sharing that, it just reminds me that like there, there's kind of 
and, and just from my perspective, there's like, it comes in trifolds, kind of like there's diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're, we've gotten to the first stage, like, and like everyone's been saying here, it's like, it's a marathon. So we got for one part, we're still working as a community together on these other parts. And again, these are not, it's not a short sprint. It's a long marathon. We're like, we got 40, 40 minutes in and we still have like a long, long ways to go. But I appreciate everyone's um, comments and share outs. Um, I'm now gonna turn it on over to Judge for um, some additional information. Go ahead. Hey, everybody, um, first of all, I want to thank all the members of the Windsor Historical Society for being here this evening. I really appreciate this. I hope we can continue this dialogue as well as Windsor's Black history. I would welcome a part two of this if you all are willing. Um, we'll get with Doug and see if he's willing to do that. Um, I'm so grateful. I just want to say also that next week we will be talking about health, health disparities and uh, communities of color. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Lushima Aku Weir, Dr. Maria Akan, uh, State Senator Saeed Anwar. We may have uh, Dr. Terranova. I'm not sure. I'm just called statement it out there. But you'll get this flyer in your email um, when it's complete. Um, and we hope that you join us for that. Um, we have Bridge Brothers coming up on March the 10th. Um, we also have Phenomenal Win Women of Windsor for Winter uh, Women's History Month. Um, we have Anti-Jewish uh, Community Conversation, Anti-Semitism. Uh, we're talking to, with Lewis about presenting voting rights. Um, so we're getting around. We have intersections on rape. And of course, we wouldn't be HRC without Juneteenth. It's coming. And we're partnering with our sister town, Bloom, uh, Bloomfield, with, on that. So this year will be extra special. It'll be a bi-city celebration. So I hope you'll stay tuned for that. I think Cassie has something to say about our webpage. Oh, yes, on our webpage. I'm going to pop it in the chat. Um, so if you would like to have a copy of our recordings from this event or previous events, feel free to um, check it out. Um, you can go to the Town of Windsor webpage and then click on Community Development, and then you'll see Human Relations Commission. So everything is documented there. Um, you can see the start of our conversation from 2020 all the way up to present day. So if you want to catch yourself up on some amazing com previous conversations, um, feel free to do so. Um, and thank you, Judge, for um, all that you do as well. I just want to shout you out because I know you do a lot. So thank you. Well, I thank you too, Cassie, my new vice chair. I just love you. I just love you. Um, so I just want to say thank you once again for everybody being here. I hope you will tell people about these conversations and share with people. And I hope you will join us next week for our discussion on health disparities and communities of color. Please join us. I got to go watch Housewives of Atlanta. So I will see you all later. Bye.